Hello! Thanks for tuning in. I'm Thomas Dinas and I welcome you to another episode of our brand new podcast, The Delicious Legacy. Today, for our very first interview, I have with me Vasilis Hamam, a Greco Palestinian chef who lives and works in London. Hello. Vasili, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for being our first guest. Thank you. And hopefully not our last. <laughs> <laughs> or our only let's guest. Let's see. Let's see. I hope, <laughs> I hope it's not on me, but yeah, let's see. Uh, definitely not on you. No. I think this one is on me. Okay, let's see. I'll do my best. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure you have lots of interesting stories from uh, the world of uh, London restaurants to tell us. Well... Yeah, it depends how we take the conversation. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> let's see. So, yeah, um, our podcast basically is going to be, uh, we're going to be talking about food, as we've just said. Uh, so it's all about, um, as you've guessed from um, the name of the podcast, all about historical food, all about um, interesting recipes from the past, from the future, traditional recipes, um, and generally about food and the food scene in London, the restaurants and whatever else we we like to talk yeah. really uh, Let's see. food drink <laughs> and <laughs> yeah food and drink yeah from so, those yeah, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> what did you drink last night then beer, beer. <laughs> after the long shift i think yeah. yeah yeah it was so hot so yeah and also dehydrated yeah can so, imagine yeah oh, well i know from First had experience. I also yeah. had some sparkling water, I have to good, say. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So, Vasilis, um, as we said, you're Greco Palestinian? Yeah, well, my dad's or originally Palestinian. Uh, his parents left Palestine for Jordan, as uh, most Palestinians did. Um, and then, so I think he, he, well, basically he grew up there in Jordan and then he left to study, went to Greece, met my mom. And so, yeah, I'm half, half. I bet you had uh, some really tasty food back home when you were growing up. Y- yeah. And I think looking back at it, I think this is basically what has in a way shaped what I do now. But yeah, it took a while for me to realize. But yeah, good food. Yeah, excellent, yeah. excellent. That's what I like to hear. Mm. Um, so, yeah, tell us a, a bit about uh, where you where are you working now? <clears throat> at the moment, I'm working at a place called the Catalyst Cafe. It's in uh, central London, in Chancery Lane, and I've been there. I think now I'm already in my second year, and um, it's a coffee roasters. So, our coffee roaster guy gets. Um, the green beans from all over the world and he has like in a crazy amounts of knowledge about these things and where he can get the best coffee the best you know uh, process of um, how it's produced and fermented and then he 
brings it in London and roasts but creates a profile for the um, for these particular coffees and makes a recipe. Yeah, it's a very, very interesting thing to witness on a daily basis just across my kitchen. So mm. yeah, and also a little bit similar to making food, I think. Well, I don't know. I think so. A maybe he, chemistry, maybe he doesn't, of... but I don't know. <laughs> I think so. It's definitely a long process. It's a good thing to have just across the kitchen though and observe. Yeah, yeah, mm. I can imagine. Uh, so the restaurant is in um, what, on, the on, is on Grazing Road. Grazing yeah. Road. yeah, yeah, great. And then um, you do obviously breakfast and uh, yeah. Brunch, I mean, we the, the, it's the coffee thing. Then they they do amazing coffee, obviously, and then we do brunch, uh, breakfast, brunch. Um, and on Fridays I do bar snacks, so it's like meze or tapas uh, for cocktails. Yeah, sounds good. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why last night you were doing a 16-hour shift. Yeah, well, yeah. it was a long shift uh, last night, but yeah, good, busy and nice. Well, thank you for coming today thank on your you. day off. Uh, yeah, we are okay. grateful <laughs> that you're here with us and talking about all your tasty recipes, which we see on Instagram. and uh, ah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we drool. Mm. Thank you. You should come soon. Yeah, I, mean, I, know, I know you've had a few other things, but yeah, mm. you should come again. Mm. You should come on a Friday, actually. Yes, Friday Get the bar night. snacks. Exactly. Different, you know. And now we got, like, charcoal <laughs> and stuff like that, and uh, it's it's good fun. <laughs> yeah. I have to come. Yeah. Now you you mentioned charcoal. Yeah, this is, it goes like one interview you do, then you have to come over at my place and I give you the food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sounds good. good. Uh, so what uh, bar snacks did you do last night? Last night, um, well, we did octopus with uh, tahini and esme salad. Esme is like a Turkish um, salad of very very finely chopped. Tomatoes, peppers, onions, sumac, pomegranate molasses, uh, very tart, mm -hmm. um, like a brilliant, very refreshing. And that was with, yeah, very, very charred octopus. Then what we had, we had, we had this chicken thigh that we do that goes with a, a sauce that contains coffee and chilies and, um, and other things there. That's yeah. like a kind of like a fried chicken, but with with a twist. The coffee we use the coffee quite a lot in in the food. Mm -hmm. uh, use it as a spice uh, in place of uh, smoked paprikas and yeah, and yeah, stuff like that. So so yeah. And then what else we had? We had manti, which is my my sous chef did this beautiful manti. The uh, lamb neck filled uh, Turkish style pasta with a yogurt sauce and oh. um, <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, yes. and brown butter <laughs> <laughs> and then what did I have wait what was the octopus I have to check my Instagram I'm, going to say <laughs> still, <laughs> I'm not hangover I'm not no hangover. no you're not hangover wait. <laughs> and um, I have butter. I don't know I will remember yeah, let me have yeah. a look at my menu actually I have my menu with me. Brilliant. Let's let's see your menu. So, oh yeah, I did mussels. Um, how, can, how did I forget? Uh, I did mussels, which I love, and we found these uh, great mussels wild from uh, Wales, uh, Welsh mus mussels, and then these were in ouzo sauce. You know the ones that they do in Greece in the tavernas with um, mustard and green yeah. peppers ouzo. It was a bit like that. A bit different, but yeah, that that was the, the inspiration, the, the taverna. And then we did uh, lamb offal, which was lungs, kidneys and liver, with um, kind of a comfy of kumquat and the and onion salad with, you know, the Turkish kebab kind of place, mm -hmm. onion salad. Yeah. Cause, just because I like, I love raw onion, it's my favorite thing. And then, yeah, that was in a flatbread. Nice. Yeah. So how did you do the? How did you cook the offal? Like uh, on the, um, the charcoal. I mean, I have charcoal, but it was because yesterday it was just one dish that would require the charcoal, so we didn't set it up, and um, so it was yeah just charred on the on the grill. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Yeah. So simply child, child. Yeah, yeah, breed. yeah, yeah. Child, and very, very fast, you know. So it's only we. It would be a bit of a yeah. It was. It's just, just so fast on the on the on a very hot grill, and it, you get like a lovely caramelization. That I think the charcoal would have to be. It would have to be a different cut mm. f- for it not to be overcooked inside. Yeah. To get some good color on. Do you have quite small pieces? Yeah, it was. It was like suv- suvlaki yeah. kind of size. Yeah, yeah. That you know, makes bits sense. of um, bits of. Oh, well, souvlaki or you say kalamaki, I don't know. Like, souvlaki. No, yeah, cool. Yeah, <laughs> good. Okay. I think uh, most people will understand the souvlaki. Mm. Unless you're in Greece and you're from Athens. Yeah, yeah, then yeah. Then it's kalamaki. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, yeah probably, I'm sure. I'm sure we all know. Anyway, it was like, um, let's say, um, a satsuma segment size. Mm. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense, yeah. yeah. Good. Because in Greece we do really cook very, very well. Yeah. And liver and, um, yeah. Unfortunately. <laughs> yes. Do, yeah. So yeah, I did it. I did it quite pink both. So it was lungs, and kidneys and uh, liver, mixed. So yeah, good bit of um, variety in terms of texture. Mm. And yeah, it worked really well with the kumquat, um, and the onions. I thought, and a bit of yogurt there. Yeah. Yeah, I'm always intrigued because I see it on your Instagram, the kumquat confit with sometimes I've seen it with fish, I believe. Yeah, I've and done it with uh, I've done it like with cured mackerel and and yeah, we've we've used it a few times. Uh, I I like these ingredients that are in season for a short while. Yeah, and when I get them, I I kind of go for it. Yeah, yeah. How, how does it how does it taste with the offal? How 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 is the, the combination? Well, I mean, Ofal has this kind of gamey, strong taste, so you want with it something to cut through it, but not to demolish it. Mm. So you just need to be a little bit careful with how you cut the kumquats and how much you use mm-hmm. and, you know, how much you allow the sourness to go through or how much you want it to sweeten. So you play a little bit with this. It's not. It's it, it, yeah. It's a bit like of a balance that you need to get right. Otherwise, it can be uh, off. Mm-hmm. You know, and it would be. But yesterday, I think we got it. We were very, very happy with it. Great. All of us. I will do the testing. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Um. So, what are your favorite things to cook? Um, I like cooking eggs and I like cooking fish, I think. Eggs and fish. Eggs. Yeah. Uh, and I like cooking pasta and sauces. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's for yourself or for... Um... In general, I just like this as ingredients and as um, the experience of cooking as, you know, pastime. Not only just work, but as a thing to do. Mm. Um, and with fish, it's just that, you know, there's this sweet spot that if you get right it's just uh, beautiful and yeah i like i like doing it as just you know just something yeah something to do but um you know how other people i guess would play the guitar or something like that Mm. i love fish too yeah Mm. so uh, today i got some for (laughs) for me for tomorrow oh really what did you get uh, lemon sole. Nice. So I got a, a whole lemon nice. sole. Nice. I think I'm going to put it in the barbecue if it's not raining. Nice. Nice. Put barbecue. it on the barbecue even if it's raining. Come on. <laughs> you have a lemon sole. Yeah. I sure. mean, it's hot anyway. Yeah. So it's exactly. only a bit of water. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it has a lid, so. Yeah. No excuses, really. Cool. No. Yeah. No. <laughs> Just get an umbrella, you'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, now that I've got a garden, I have um, lots of herbs. I'm growing lots of oh, herbs. Oh, nice. Nice. So. I've got my chives and I've got my nice, parsley. Nice, nice. I've got my. Dill. I mean, that's a lovely thing with London, isn't it? In relation to Greece, where we both come from. I mean, I didn't have a garden, did you? No, no. no. Yeah, that's a great thing that we live in a a massive city that exactly. and we can have bits of garden. Not that I have a garden. <laughs> you don't. <laughs> no, no, but I mean, you know, my my friends have, oh, yeah. and we can have like barbecues and mm. they get you know all that. I have a small balcony though, and I do have a very small barbecue that was gifted to a friend of mine that didn't have a balcony so he gave it to me and it's one of those cheap 
barbecues with uh, that are uh, painted over as a football. So yeah. it's like an embarrassing barbecue, which <laughs> which I love. <laughs> embarrassing barbecue. I like it already. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, so tell us a little bit about your story. How did you begin um, to cook professionally in London? Because I think uh, that's an interesting story that people would like to hear, to be honest. If yeah, you're not, uh, well, it, uh, no, well, it came uh, very late. In my life, I started doing it um, professionally when I was already 34. Okay. Pretty um, late. Uh, no, like crazy late crazy in late. relation to, well, I mean, you know, in, in a sense, there's no, there's never late and all that. But, mm-hmm. you know, in, the, in relation to what we come to be accustomed as the norm. Yeah. And yeah, the that's pretty people. late. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, yeah, I started... Um, I left Greece when I was 19 to become an architect. And then one or two years down the line of studying architecture, I changed. And I enrolled myself to St. Martin's to do fine art. So I did fine art, my BA, and then I did a year off, and then I did my MA, fine art. And then I wanted to do a PhD. Then I didn't do that. I was working in um, galleries trying to do shows, being an artist for after my graduation from my MA for years and years and years and years. And it's a tough um, life you yeah. know, to to manage as you get older. I mean, I got I graduated in 2005. Yeah. Then it was maybe I think it was at least like 10, 12 years that I was working in the same gallery you know, telling people off if they touch sculptures, giving a bit of information here and there. And then, yeah, it was like a, a tough thing that wasn't going anywhere. And all these years, I loved cooking, but in a way, inside me, I had already chosen my path, which was the arts, the arts which yeah. I still right, love and everything. But yeah, it was like a choice that I was quite solid inside me. And also, I've always felt that, you know, in order to, to do cooking... You need to study, have experience. Da, da, da. In the galleries, I would I would watch the chefs. They all looked like eighteen years old. I was yes. already much older. They all looked like, you know, in a different life than mine. Um, so I thought that's impossible. However, after many many years, that I I wanted to to change what I do, you know, stop telling people off when they take photos in a gallery. Yeah. I found myself I couldn't do anything because my CV was basically a single line saying um, an artist that has worked in a gallery forever. (laughs) That was my CV. So anyway, I don't remember how it happened, but then I came across this uh, thing on the internet that you enroll yourself, you register with them, and you apply for a license for for cooking at home, and they upload your menu uh, on their um, platform, and you cook at home, and then somebody puts a, an order through, you cook it, and you take it to them. So I I did that, which that didn't require any CV. It just required crazy people that are okay to do that as a profession. Yeah, exactly. So as soon as I did that, I was just hooked with this. So I was like cooking like crazy all day, sending people on, uh, sending the food on my bike, getting lost, getting punctures in the rain, and then, you know, coming back at home doing it again and again and again. I don't know how many times a day, but I loved it. My flatmates hated me because <laughs> the, you know, the kitchen and the fridge was just Constantly full of full occupied. of my my stuff. Exactly. <laughs> um, but anyway, that company went bust. <laughs> really? I think within three weeks or no, not three weeks. Sorry. Uh, anyway, very Pretty shortly soon, after yeah. I, but I had already in a way put my one of my legs into the waters you know what i mean so i got and and also i had like suddenly i had a 
something that looked like a CV. Mm. And I didn't have to lie on my CV, <laughs> you know, <laughs> for once. And then um, I just, um, I, got a, I got a job somewhere in a cafe, at Cafe Otto, I think. Yeah, that was my first job. At Cafe Otto, I got the job within two weeks of doing this, you know, and it was like, oh, hello, I'd like to work here. I loved Cafe Otto because of the music. I liked the food that they do. So I went, I spoke to them. And the question was like, okay, have you got any experience? And I was like, yeah, just I do that, you know. So suddenly this was a, a CV for me. And that was also then, it was the beginning of Instagram. Mm -hmm. So in a way that stood in for my lack of experience or lack of documents that I do this and that. And I didn't really have to speak because, you know, you take a photo and it's there. Or you put your recipes on and it's there. So people see that instantly and they kind of know, I guess. And because I was into the arts and, and everything and communicating, I guess, and expressing myself and, and liking pretty things and um, taking photos, yeah, my, I was really active on that Instagram and, you know, really hustling <laughs> chefs and people and commenting and da -da -da, making them notice what I do. Uh, yeah, so it worked out. I had a job at Cafe Otto cooking. Brilliant. I think what um, probably helped as well was the fact um, that the food was influenced from Persia in Cafe Otto. At Cafe Otto, they, they are doing Persian. Soli's food. Soli had the kitchen. She still has beautiful Persian-inspired uh, food um, that, you know, to me, in a way, we had this common you know, pro f flavor profiles in our brains in yeah, a way. Exactly. A little bit different, but I could adjust to that. And she could, uh, you know, enjoy what I was doing. Mm. Yeah, there was the freedom of, you know, using spices da -da -da, and communicating about food and flavor. It was never just doing a set thing that yeah, um, is stiff. The look of the food as well, it was just... Uh, it was never boring for me. It wasn't just me being in the kitchen, just um, long hours uh, cutting onions. I mean, I did that afterwards uh, and everything, but that was a beautiful time as a first um, experience, first experience of a kitchen. Yeah. kitchen yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 exactly. And no. also in a beautiful environment, like environment in the sense that it was art. You know, lots of artists, musicians yeah. around me, feeding people that I used to listen to their music. As a teenager, yeah, stuff like that. You <laughs> I know. can imagine. Yeah, I was. Uh, yeah, I remember seeing a lot of the photos and your Instagram posts about that. Yeah, I mean, I've done hummus for Thurston Moore. <laughs> yeah, from Sonic, from Sonic Youth. Our hero. Yeah, I was. I almost fainted <laughs> to do that. To do that hummus. <laughs> Brilliant. What did he say? Did he enjoy it? I don't know. I hope so. <laughs> I, mean, I hope so. Genius. Anybody else um, that you remember? Fondly? Yeah, it was also Kim Gordon. Yeah. But yeah, it was lots, lots of people, lots of people of um, the stuff that I used to listen to, and and other types of music were more experimental that I had no idea about, but I loved. So I was just in a, a yeah in a great environment that was all, almost like a university environment, you know, mm. just like looking and learning and observing. People doing amazing yeah. things, and I think, I think your your food um, experiences from from life obviously uh, wasn't too difficult to translate to what Otto and uh, yeah yeah and, and um, wanted, uh, it was a, a good a very very good beautiful exchange you know of um, of these flavors and pre flavor profiles and you know talk about food yeah. do the food sell the food. Take a photo, post on Instagram, <laughs> listen to some good music, you know. And um, so, yeah, then um, obviously you left um, after a while. Mm. And um, now you are for about two years in uh, Cap Catalyst. Catalyst. Yeah. So I think uh, what happened is, um, if I, yeah, at uh, Otto, that was like, when? Is it five years ago, I think? Mm -hmm. 
five, I think. It might be six. I think it's five. Um, yeah, I broke my... I had a bicycle accident. And then, so that made me stop working for two months. I broke my clavicle. Yeah. Uh-huh. And then I came back to work after two months. And um, I worked there for a bit. But then I got another job at, uh, at the Adam and Eve. Uh, working with, uh, yeah, with a head chef, sous chef, and so on. And so I did like a more normal kind of restaurant environment. Yeah, different uh, job there. Very, very different after that. Um, Was it hard? Did you find uh, it hard? Yeah, I mean, it was, but it's the best thing in a way I've done. Mm Mm-hmm. Because in terms of understanding, you know, good practice and all that, I didn't have any experience. So that was how I got it. Through observing a head chef that was crazy passionate and skilled and a sous chef as well. That's and then um, it was tough. Uh, you know, I was, I was there like trying to do as best I can, failing constantly getting you know kind of told off and all that at me being already maybe 35 these guys being at least 10 years younger than me but i didn't mind you know because it was just learning and um, it was hard but yeah beautiful and i still i mean to me these guys i look up to and i I kind of almost think about on on a daily basis. Mm. Well, uh, who was a head chef there when uh, you worked? It was Michael, Michael Harrison. Yeah, great guy. And the food. Uh, the food was like modern, modern British. Modern I would British, say. A lot of and they would get uh, yeah a lot. Uh, I mean, these guys would have. Um, they would work with uh, Cornwall Project, which uh, was, um, which is. Basically, bringing um, produce from Cornwall and meat uh, to London restaurants. So the quality of the produce was just amazing, mm. and so was the cooking. Um, Did you know much about uh, Cornwall back then? No, and the no, no so nothing. I guess it was a beautiful new uh, yeah. door opening. It was amazing. You. Well, it was just amazing, you know, just to see people uh, having this connection with. Um, whoever gives you the produce, you know, the farmers, the, the, the butchers, and so yeah. on. Because there is an, an integrity there that I hadn't seen before, definitely hadn't seen in London. Yeah. I've seen, like, in villages in Greece, but that was it. Mm. And, um, yeah, and I saw the amazing work and effort and creativity that there is behind this. What people try to do with food here in London? Yeah, not in London in general in the UK. And yeah, just a beautiful, beautiful thing. I worked with these people, with these guys, with Mike, for I think it was seven or eight months. And it was, it's definitely the. I mean, it sounds like nothing to, you know, to say that. But for me, it was. Uh, it's probably the most important work that I've ever done. Mm. And the most uh, influential, yeah, on me. So I guess the restaurant Adam and Eve still exists. Yeah, still it's a different kitchen though, different. Uh, yeah. Different people. Yeah, yeah. That always changes with a lot yeah, of restaurants. Yeah, yeah, of course. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. How often? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, I mean, Michael went on to get even more experience. I mean, yeah, I just I just love how committed that this man is with yeah. food he went to do like he was you know head chef back then getting paid and everything and left this to go and do experience really yeah in the states in australia everywhere in all the best restaurants <laughs> so you know there's a level of commitment there that uh, i really admire i haven't i don't know if i've told tim but i mean i uh, yeah very very deeply admire to this day and kind of get uh, inspired by him I guess he's younger as well, right? Yeah, he was like, I think he was 27 back then when I was Mm. 35. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. 
I'll tell him one day. <laughs> one day, yeah. <laughs> no, I think I think it's important also. Yeah, if you're young and you have this experience as young, then you you can actually do. You can be a bit more bolder, I think. Uh, yeah, so I mean, he he he's really committed about what he does. He he I mean, back then to me, it it took a while for me to be cool with it. You know, not not, not that I wasn't cool with it, but. Uh, you know, a head chef wants something this way, you have to do it this, this way. way yes, yeah. I know. And I, many times, I, I just couldn't do it. You know? Yeah, me, yeah. sometimes so, I think about so it. I like, got my know. fair share of, <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. It's a bit like the army. Yeah, it was very much like the army, not yeah. that I've been, <laughs> but you know. <laughs> I've like, been, I can was, tell you. <laughs> I'm, sure it's, I'm sure it's probably less, the army is probably less. Shouty. Than, yeah, than this. yeah, but I mean, amazing. Mm. It's good if you work with good people as well. I mean, uh, my last big experience with um, working in the kitchen, in the commercial kitchen, um, it was it was it was six people in a very small, crammed in a very small place, and yeah, doing long shifts, and getting tired, and me being the oldest of all the mm. chef assistants and sous chefs, and uh, mm. um, I felt a little bit out of place. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, how, how I mean, in my place. case, feeling out of out of place was a given and kind of something that I had accepted, okay. Okay. and kind of something that I embraced mm-hmm. because I knew that I lack the experience, the formal experience, let's say. Yeah. The experience, yeah. you know, I, w- I hadn't worked in a proper restaurant, I hadn't seen proper practice, I hadn't studied anything. It was just like I've, I've watched a lot of YouTube. I think there was a, a time before I started working professionally that I think I had watched all anything that has to do anything with food you know, on YouTube. Because <laughs> I was probably, it was such an obsession of mine. It was probably like 10 hours a day. Trying to absorb. For years, for years, you know, but never done it professionally. Just loved it. Um, so, so I had it, you know, how my approach with work was like, listen, Vasilis, you have no experience. You are really old for this. You don't know what you're doing. So you have to just accept it and uh, just keep going and embrace all the hardships and, you know, what you have lacking in experience, lacking in talent, lacking in knowledge. The only thing I had was my body in a way and that I could put it in you know in situations where other people would just get tired Mm. and quit but I thought that's the only thing I have so you know I was not quitting not slowing down you know just uh, working like a dog I guess (laughs) for a while but in a I that's what I Won it for myself, and you know this. I think because also it coincided being after the accident, I really was crazy happy that I could work and use my body again because I thought I would never possibly be able to to do That's that. So you know, suddenly, sentiment. suddenly I no, but it's beautiful, and I think it's very very useful for everyone to appreciate the fact yeah. that they, uh, you know, their hands and feet are working and whatever, and they can do what they want to do. So suddenly I started appreciating the fact that I can move and I moved, you know, mm. loads. Didn't so <laughs> that was my kind of, you know, everybody else has experience, everybody else is that, that everybody else might be more talented, but they will, you know, but I will not stop. So Excellent. that was the approach. <laughs> and um, you still love it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so it's, it hasn't. I, know, I think kind of, I, then I got addicted to this. You know, working like this, and just mm. the pace being of the really, energy. yeah, and just working like this. You know, just doing crazy hours. I don't know. I loved it. Yeah, <laughs> it's a bit weird. Great. No, that, that's that's interesting. No, mm. I have. Uh, so when I was working in the restaurant, the last big restaurant I was working in, and you know, all the the um, the, the chefs were younger, much younger than me, but there was some that. There was a guy who was about then, about twenty-one years old. Mm. So he was, um, he wasn't um, uh, sous chef um, yet, but he was, he was getting there. Uh, 
But yeah, the amount of uh, energy, and he was there first thing in the morning, yeah. uh, probably living last thing yeah. the night, and doing everything, and remembering yeah. every recipe of you know, 16, 20 different recipes we had, and making cakes and desserts. Yeah. And I was like, fuck, that's, that's a lot of energy for yeah. someone to have. But, and yeah. I was thinking, yeah, I'm 36, 37 years old. Yeah. And I was like, I don't think I, I would be able to do <laughs> what he's doing. And yeah. I, I kind of felt, I admired him, obviously, for his energy and for his talent. Yeah. But I was thinking, I'm never going to be 21. <laughs> yeah. How am I supposed to I mean, last him here? Yeah. And with this, to be honest, and in my case, it was, even though it was good and I loved it, and, you know, if I had it to happen again to me, I would do it this way again. I think at the end of the day, it can be self-destructive mm -hmm. to work like this and it can be damaging physically mentally and with your relationships mm -hmm. so uh, there you know in in this um in this job there is a few things that uh i think needs to be looked at somehow again yeah yeah because there's a lot of people pushing this themselves um in kitchens maybe above what should be legal you know yeah yeah yeah, yeah there's always mm. that uh, that fine line that uh, people cross and they don't it's i guess it's a little bit i mean there is like people doing sports and stuff that get into this uh, but this is this is different you know and then I, what did i do i mean then i stopped working at the adam and Eve with these guys and i got a job at um a cafe i was uh at different cafe just doing uh, kind of cafe food. So well, it was then. Kind of your own, yeah. your own recipes. Yeah, yeah, in, in yeah. I mean, so this is how I think now this is probably what, four years ago? This is how I got into the brunch, cafe kind of brunch situation. Yeah. Uh, which I still kind of do. So I think the thing is that uh, this, a few years ago, you know, you had this kind of thing with coffee that suddenly, you know, in London, coffee became an important thing yeah. and roasting of coffee and coffee culture. Yeah. Whereas before, you know, <laughs> it was just, yeah, I shouldn't say bad words, but, you know, it wasn't very good. And it was a tough thing to find, a yeah. coffee. It was, good and coffee, then suddenly we had, you had, okay, then, then you had these, like, Costa and stuff like that. Oh, rubbish. But then, yeah. Um, and then you had the um, um, light roast culture that came in, and then the brunch. So and then, and then you you know suddenly from food in terms of food, then this started to become I guess better the food in cafes. Yeah, because you said the more, very yeah because you know it was like something coffee. flourishing, like a scene. It became a scene, and lots of places popping up everywhere doing you know this avon toast kind of thing but then this became better and better and better and then yeah. you have like good chefs working in uh, cafes possibly kind of some of them being influenced by good restaurants so you th there was a development in the food scene that yeah suddenly it wasn't just avon toast with wilted spinach and um, poached egg there was starting to be fun and interesting and yeah. you know almost like you know when you get like a new music genre yeah and then you have hubs of this and then everybody kind of knows everybody else that does it it was a, a similar thing but with cafes and brunch mm. and i think it's still going on yeah right? still going on yeah and this is what i try to do these days really you know, we go to, we see the re restaurant scene is amazing here in London and also what we see from Instagram from across the world. I guess, you know, there's still this thing with a celebrity chef and, sh you know, chef stuff on television everywhere, which has kind of pushed yeah. this. Um, and then, so with the brunch that I do and then with the brunch that exists here in London these days, modern brunch, I guess, is influenced by... They try and, you know, ca cover this distance between the high-quality restaurant food and cafe. Yeah. So 
in a sense, food that can be fast in the same time that you can get a coffee. So yeah. you don't, you know, wait for ever, obviously, and it can be a takeout, but it can also ring a bell in terms of flavor, quality, yes, and uh, combinations to a, a good restaurant. Mm. Oh, so yeah. that's where that's where you have good suppliers. Uh, yeah, good for suppliers, your food, you know, fresh, methods. fresh uh, stuff. So yeah, all that. Yeah, what some you have sort in the of restaurants. creativity put in there so that it's fun. Yeah. Um, and and uh, also so that it's desirable from people because people are mar- much more knowledgeable uh, these days about food and what's going on and who does what because this information is very easy to share obviously you know there's like all these like everyone is almost like a food blogger these days mm. because with their phone you know people follow either other sexy people or cats and dogs funny stuff and and food and food yeah food markets so restaurants lots of people yeah. like know about a lot these days about food um almost like it's a um, light entertainment kind of thing as if yeah. it's music or yeah. film seems so yeah you're right so yeah brunch uh, and lunch uh, i think i think we have it from the mediterranean quite it's quite important especially from the east i think lunch is more important in a way at least at home yeah, i mean brunch wasn't a We do breakfast, right? We do breakfast. And then we have late lunch. Yeah. But we have a lot of things that could be brunch. It's just that mm. that word wasn't no. invented, I guess, or it didn't mean anything yeah. until recently in Greece. And, and you know, even here, there's still, like, lots of people that consider it, um, like, a novelty. Yeah. Thing, you know, not yeah. a really existing thing, like a marketing thing, which in many ways it is, but whatever. Yeah. It's um, it's just basically a lot of food mm. you know, you... that has a lot of bread and a lot of eggs and yes. a lot of avocado. <laughs> <laughs> Nowadays, yeah, I suppose when when we grew up, I don't know how it was on your household, but I think Saturdays and maybe Sundays was big uh, breakfast days for us. Mm. So yeah, mm-hmm. we would cook, mm. uh, you know, maybe bacon and eggs or an omelette or some scrambled eggs with uh, peppers and feta cheese. Yeah. So, yeah, in a way, it's what you eat for yeah, brunch in London now. You know, yeah, I mean, way. this big breakfast that we do, and they do in the Middle East, I don't know, and all these, like, pastries and pies pastries, and yes, these yes, kind exactly. of things. Um, in a way, it is, it could be seen as brunching. Yeah. You know, whereas mm. here you had the, I'm not sure, um, really, I'm trying to think now, not to say something silly about this but I think you know you had the cafes with for breakfast and it was a very very specific thing and the full mm. English breakfast you can say that it's like brunch but it's one thing one you thing. know it's yeah. one very specific yeah I don't I, I don't know maybe maybe the maybe it's just that it's like a coffee cafe A, a food that it is, you know, designed in a cafe, mm. essentially, and to be consumed in a cafe or when you want to recreate that at home. But yeah. it's essential. But it's mainly a, a cafe thing. You go out for you know, uh, as your your day off or whatever it is or your break, and it's like okay, I'm gonna go to this cafe, get a coffee, get some food. And you call that food brunch. <laughs> yeah. What um, What are your favorite um, things to cook with in terms of um, f- for the restaurant, of course? Because um, t- you have your favorite spices, for example, uh, that you uh, you said coffee. Yeah, you well, spice, yeah. Which is a brilliant idea, I think. I, I use uh, a lot of Middle Eastern sumac. flavors. Yeah. So you have a lot like, of Okay, so, I mean, what I do, the food that I do is a little bit Greek, A little bit Middle Eastern, and I guess it's modern British. Yeah, it has that element too. Um, I've been here 21 years. That's more than I've been in Greece. And the, in also the food that I do is, is adjusted for this market. Mm. I think if I was in Greece, I would do a diff- probably different. different, probably. But um, so I use quite a lot of... It's heavy on uh, Greekness in a sense, but I don't present, you know, I don't... 
say that I do Greek food. Yeah. Because um, yeah. it's not really, and I don't have any, uh, I'm not really precious about um, calling it Greek, saying to, or, or claiming any Greekness, any authenticity. Yeah. I'm an immigrant, as my dad was, and I adjust with where I am, mm-hmm. you know, with what ingredients I have. And um, I definitely have different ingredients here than I have in Greece. Yeah, exactly. I have less in terms of some of the stuff that we have and more in some other senses. Uh, and also I have a whole bunch of different spices. That you would never have in Greece? Yeah, very, I mean, maybe some parts of Athens, mm. but, you know, these kind of more... Because here you get everything from for all. Oh yeah, yeah. Don't, so there's nothing to so, yeah. argue so, about that. And in a way, you know, I grew up without any real kind of. I'm not really protective of any identities, you see, because I'm half half. And what I try and do is maybe I guess I don't want to be like sentimental about it, but maybe up to an extent, it was this exciting thing that I had at home that my dad would play around with my mom's food. Mm. So my dad being Arabic would kind of put some Arabic elements into Greek food. And basically that's what I do. Uh, so, it's just quite that, also modern British, modern you know? British, yeah, yeah but but with in these two yeah. influences um in in there. Which is great. Yeah. Yeah, I so think. I think it was like a private joke, you know, when I was growing up, it was almost like a private joke between my dad and myself and he would put sumac in whatever in the stew you know the greek stew or the greek salad or coriander something like that you know and this was uh, for me the fun that i would have with Mm. my dad i'm not into football nor he yeah i'm not in you know there wasn't like i wasn't discussing discussing cars or girls or things like that it was food so yeah and then i realized when i do it here, I mean, here, a few years ago, you had like Otolangi, mm. and he has popularized the very, Middle Eastern food very, very, very much, and made yeah. it uh, lovable, you know, and popular. So basically, and after him, lots of other cafes followed in these tracks. So they use za'atar, hummus, mm. cardamom, um, these amazing Middle Eastern salads this balance of yeah. something be so refreshing. Yes. And then, so for me, it was like, in a sense, good timing because people then wouldn't have, I wouldn't have to kind of force anyone into trying sumac. They all knew it. And they, you know, and Zata, they all knew it and they were like willing to to try. Yeah. But mine had a bit of a different, you know, it had that Greekness in there mm. that um, I tried to to put there in a more modern, I guess, way than yes. what Did we are norm, it, yeah. than what we are used to here in London. Or that, I mean, now there are modern Greek restaurants here in mm. London, but back then there wasn't really that much. Like the presence of Greek food was mostly on some tavernas or, or some really uh, expensive places. Yeah. So it wasn't on this kind of cafe brunch level. Yeah, the stereotypical thing, you know, uh, moussaka. Yeah, you had that, and you had like, I don't remember the name of the the restaurant that was like, yeah, they would bring like, you know, fish from Greece and stuff like that. I find ridiculous. That's. And like really. Living in an island. Pricey. Yeah, exactly. And also, like, we live in a different place, you know. I think it's a beautiful thing being an immigrant and adjusting to where you are. Mm. This is how food develops anyway. Yeah. You know, the recipes that we have in Greece come from somewhere else then they came back then they went somewhere else again then they came back it just continuously develops with war with commerce mm. uh, immigration i suppose um, talking about uh, food and historical elements i think something like moussaka it's yeah. uh, something that quintessentially with defined as greek nowadays yeah. both in greece and abroad but it's not really something yeah. that you can it, consider it historically but see, greek but you know in a sense that you know I think we can consider every, anything, anything in a way, you know. Uh, for example, you have sakshuka. If you if you observe the um, how sakshuka has developed historically, and with place, it's crazy. How Basically, you have give us huevos a... rancheros, right? It's yeah. eggs and tomatoes. Yeah. Then you have the tomatoes arriving in 
Europe. You have a dish, I think, um, uh, first uh, developed um, in North Africa. Then the immigrants took it to Palestine. Then it, the immigrants went back to North Africa, <laughs> s- slightly changing every time that where it was anywhere, slightly being changed with with meat, food, liver, I think there was, with some spices, then back again, then back again. Then, you know, the, you had this... Um, Sef- the Sephrodites, I think there's a name called... The Sephrodite the, Jews, yeah? yeah? Yeah, moving it back to Israel. Then you, then it went back to North Africa, then it went to Greece. So, you know, <laughs> then you have this kind of food developed everywhere. The Mediterranean especially is like a lake where yeah. people move about. Exactly. Uh, war, occupation, as I said, immigration. But also so, trade, commerce, and also, curiosity. Yeah, yeah, language travels this way, music travels this way, music. and food as well. Uh, so really, authenticity and, you know, all these kind of things is a fluid, is a fluid thing that, yes, even if you say about, like, say, Muzaka isn't, isn't, like, it has, uh, but then after a thousand years, what is it? It is great, yeah, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah. hi- history makes these things. Mm. They're not made beforehand it's not it's not definitely not a ancient but toma- we didn't have tomatoes yeah, exactly. you know? so even like sakshuka means shaken right right but if you consider we have a similar dish strapazada which also means shaken uh-huh. it's the same thing and then you have kayanas you have um, menemen in turkey uh, i don't remember the there is a spanish one as well same thing eggs mm. with spiced tomatoes And um, your experience with uh, Muzaka, what, uh, how far back did you go to find <laughs> I don't of Muzaka? I don't remember. I've done it once. I, I love Muzaka, though. <laughs> 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 And I haven't had it for ages. But yeah, I mean, um, Muzaka, I guess, from uh, Arabic and Middle Eastern countries with the aubergines yeah. and minced meat. or Yeah, I think, I think um, you have the bechamel. Right, which I think was um, French. The chef Besson said is went, French. Yeah. yeah, but I think it was back in the Ottoman Empire days. You had French chefs visiting mm-hmm. there, training people, and then you had dishes with uh, this type of uh, French-inspired food. So then, this possibly, I'm sure that it somehow carved the way for Muzaka to exist. Mm-hmm. So it's everyone's. We, yeah, sh- we exactly. share this no. because it's like you know, I think that's the best way people, to it. people move them about exactly. Um, when uh, when I was growing up, obviously, we, we had very traditional Greek food at home, very tasty, mm. uh, but yeah, things like coriander, for example, yeah, uh, the, the spice actually, yeah. the, 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 the coriander seeds. Let alone the leaves, hmm. we never used uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, coriander or things. I mean, in like Greece, we don't really use that much spices. Mm. Um, and I mean, in northern Greece, a bit; in southern Greece, less so. And it's just a matter, really, of chance, because just across the border, somebody is using it, and you know, <laughs> we don't do we don't do hummus in yeah. Greece, right? Yeah. They do in Cyprus. There's no reason why we don't do it. It just didn't happen yeah <laughs> um, so I, th- I think for example I consider my dad somebody who was just moved from one place to the other brought some sumac with him <laughs> that's it so this uh, I think is how it's just like historical paths mm. that have led to this yeah but on the other hand these ingredients might grow in Greece Right, it's just that we don't use yeah, them. Definitely, I mean, th- my point was it's the that same, the same landscapes with the same climate. Um, coriander is a quintessentially very Mediterranean herb. You, you, you used to grow in Greece and you used in ancient cuisine a lot. Yeah, and I mean, we found tablets from uh, Pilos in mm-hmm. um, South Greece in Peloponnese with a linear B, mm-hmm. and they describe. Uh, how they change the cumin and the coriander yeah. seeds with Egypt and I mean it's uh, weird because there is many things for example in a country that might not be used at all 
and these things might be used by a different country that doesn't have these ingredients. Mm. Uh, it's just weird how things develop historically yeah. somehow. Um, you know, parsnip is a Mediterranean vegetable. Yeah. We never have parsley, par- par- parsnip, parsnip in, in Greece. Greece. No. Never. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Bizarre. Um, Do you remember the Greek name for it? Because I, I always forget. Uh, par- uh, parsnipaki. <laughs> I don't remember. No, it's not parsnip. <laughs> no, but it's something like that. Some, something with tatataki. So, yeah. I mean, even here in London, the, uh, in London, in the UK, there is uh, sumac trees. Oh, really? I didn't know mm. that. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Uh, wild sumac trees, yeah. No, mm. wild sumac trees. Yeah. Also, um, things like uh, saffron. I mean, there's lots of places yeah, yeah. in the UK called saffron, yeah. saffron Walden, because yeah. they used to grow the, the crocus uh, okay. flower. Oh, really? Oh, I didn't know. Uh, but they used for for dye, dye for yeah. color. Yeah, okay. Uh, right. Which is very interesting. You, know, you have saffron, you import saffron from... Spain and so expensive and stuff. Mm. Could it used to be grown here? Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's just strange because you see, with farming and agriculture, yeah, follows demand and uh, the industry. We, we didn't have mushrooms in Greece until recently. <laughs> we just got bullshit mushrooms in a can. Yeah, <laughs> like uh, this is how I grew up, and then I went to Italy. I went to a market and it was just a mushroom <laughs> market. And I'm like, what? You know, and now now people have caught up with it and they do. There is beautiful mushrooms now everywhere, like you can find in Greece. Still not as much used as uh, Italy, in Italy. Example, or... But, you know, we do have them. Yeah, there's no... Uh, no there's no... so much seafood that we don't eat and we export to Italy. The vongole, the, the, like, uh, really? we don't really eat this. Uh, we export it. Okay. And then in Italy... They sold to tourists for <laughs> pasta vongole. <laughs> but, you know, there is a market for us to sell it. But, mm. yeah, we just don't consume. Dafki. 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 Parsnip. And I think parsnips and carrots are similar cousin plants and stuff. Yeah, I'm not sure, um, really. Yeah, we didn't... Um, yeah, we, hmm. yeah, I think parsnip is, came from... Either from Rome or even Greece, mm. through obviously, yeah, two thousand years ago, mm. came here. And mm. We never eat it now in Greece. I've never nope. ever seen it. Never. And not never. not like mushrooms that okay we didn't have and now we have or never. or even with my grandma. Never, 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 never. Nobody knows about it. Because mm. they, they yeah. grew up poor. I mean, also yeah. you know, for example, there is a market for it, so people will uh, grow it to sell it. Mm. There isn't, then it's just not theirs. I mean, maybe maybe television, I guess, can change the thing. Create first an audience that asks for it, and then yeah. So who knows? Yeah. Maybe we're gonna get some Greek parsnip. Maybe we're gonna export they? them and become millionaires. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think um, I think there's definitely lots of good produce, but I don't know how competitive can. Uh, this Greek small business be in the European well, market in terms of you, you have know, to you start have, somewhere. Yeah, yeah, of course. It looks like a snakes, really yeah. tough, tough thing yeah. to do. But maybe, but you know, desperation, I guess, and mm. lack of work yeah. uh, is always an in an amazing, perhaps, starting point. Incentive and a starting point. I mean, what else would you do? Would you do a olive oil? Okay, but then yeah, everybody does it. Yeah, yeah. So maybe again, yeah. maybe that's not the yeah, answer. Yeah. Maybe yeah. the answer is something like yeah. that. Yeah, try something new, and. Because Greece is not very big as a, as geographically, but it has a lot of distinctive ge- geographical and microclimate. Mm. So you can definitely do a lot of different interesting stuff. Yeah, and yeah things like mushrooms and truffles. There's no reason why you wouldn't have them in the mountains of the no, north. And also, I mean, I'm sure there is enough restaurants these days that they can buy it. Yeah, yeah. And then these restaurants, slowly, slowly, somehow, it will become more popular. So exactly. there is like a... What um, what ingredients is that you cannot live with when you're cooking? For me, for example, live without. It's, yeah, live without. Because for me, it's olive oil. For example, I wouldn't be able yeah. to to do anything without olive oil. <laughs> um, well, at home, I have to have yogurt, olive oil, garlic, and maybe. Some dried pasta or rice or something like that. 
I can live on this, I think. <laughs> Happily. Forever, <laughs> yeah. Maybe in a few tomatoes. Obviously, in the restaurant business, you have very tight margins and you have to work with um, buying in bulk stuff. Mm. Um, but is, is, there, is there an ingredient that you don't um, you find it, does it make a difference if you use really, really expensive or really good I try not to, I try not to, I try to avoid, you know, very exclusive ingredients like that. Um, I'm more, not for any other reason in, other than I enjoy, you know, trying to unfold and showcase what flavor common things have. Mm-hmm. Um, just simple things, uh, if done in this way or the other way. Um, you know, there's a, a lot of food that we consume and it can be different or it can be amazing, you know, just to get like the most... You know, I don't want to have it like a kind of a social thing that I consider to be good. It's just that I find it a lovely to, sh- you know, to to unfold the potential of something that is mm. common. Yeah. To try and do it anyway. You have really good coffee there, so, I mean, there's something... It's just like, you know, as I was the, saying the, earlier the about the fish, right? You get a yeah. piece of fish, if you cook it properly and do some good things on it, it would be a different experience. Mm. Yeah. It can be lovely anyway. I mean, I think even like, you know, I think uh, as long as the ingredient is good, it's going to be good. My mom kills fish. She overcooks them by a mile, but they're still good <laughs> because, well, I wouldn't. It wouldn't be like served, I guess, in a restaurant where you want mm. something else. But it's you know even like these kind of mistakes, I guess, that are considered mistakes. Yeah, can hold some good things in them. Right. You know, if you overcook the fish, you get the gelatin coming out of the bone Mm -hmm. seeping into the meat you don't have that otherwise and you have like a different depth of flavor in there horrible texture (laughs) but it a different depth of flavor Mm. and it it you know there's this like gelatin clinging on your mouth that carries the flavor for longer yeah makes a different mouth feel goes differently with lemon like does some different things. I think this is for for many things. You know, it can if you go and have, for example, have a look on recipes about chips these days. You will see double cook, triple double cook, cook, da da da, yeah. all these kind of things, and cut this thickness. Whereas I haven't eaten better fried potatoes than cut by hand and they're all different size so all different slightly cooked there's no consistency mm. but who cares you get crispy bits you get soft Sweet. bits you get a variety there yeah and then it's just a single single once fried because if you eat it and you don't wait the mm. inside steam will not have the time to make the chip soggy and even if some bits are, will become soggy it's good soggy because fresh, if you fry it in them, um, if it's a, a good potato like we have these in Greece, right? yeah. they're very creamy, not floury, they're waxy ones, right? And you cook it not in a in a professional environment. Uh, you would cook like high temperature. Yeah. The second frying would be maybe 190. In Greece, I'm sure they don't do that. It's just the temperature drops, I guess, when you put the chips in. So they kind of slowly cook, the inside gets good and creamy. Then by that time, the temperature of the oil has risen again, so you get the outside crispy. The, uh, instead of doing it twice. Yeah. Um, maybe, yeah, maybe that's a trick. Maybe that's, that's why they taste so it's, good it's sometimes. So good. But yeah. the oil is, is good as well that we use. I mean, my mom would um, sometimes would just use olive oil. Which, to say that here, you, yeah. you're probably mm. going to laugh at you or... You know, really never speak to you again," <laughs> he said to me, "Chef." But uh, no, I think that's yeah, a very good. It's an tip. amazing thing, and it's mm. actually it works. There's not even smoke coming out of the mm. oil. You know, when you do that, it just works, so or it doesn't make it heavy or anything. And then you put some salt and oregano on that. You know, it's great chips. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's a good tip, guys. 
Mm. Potatoes fried yeah, in olive some, oil. Maybe just get the waxy ones instead of the flowery. Yeah, waxy potatoes. Let's say. I think it even oil. I think I mean I would only buy local ingredients here, you know, mainly. I try to avoid but in the off license they do have always the um, you know, the Turkish places they do have the Cypriot potatoes. Mm. These are great for for chips. Good tip, good tip mm. to know. Mm. <laughs> bit better than Maris Piper, but I would still go for the Maris Piper just because it's from here. But, you know. Yeah, and uh, talking about the overcooking thing in Greece, we do tend to, uh, like, uh, we started with the offal that we say that we, we overcook would, everything, I think, would, yeah. in, Greek, in Greece. Yeah, I don't know why it's um, that, but um, as you said, sometimes it work, and if you think about the offal, like liver, lung, and so on, if you put in the cocorecce, in the skewer, and wrapped Mm. With cold fat and then wrapped again with the mm. with the intestines. Yes, you cook it a long time and stuff, but then because you have the fat inside, I think you keep yeah. They keep I mean, the moisture. I would itself. love to try the Turkish one because it looks amazing. And a, a chef friend of mine went and had it, and they do In much Turkey. less yeah much less cooking. It looks like uh. so juicy. It's not pink or bloody or anything. But it just looks so juicy. You know, it looks amazing. I'd like to try that. But yeah, the um, yeah. I mean, you know, in Greece we overcook things. But you know, if you have an overcooked steak in Greece, which you will, uh, it's different, and it can be amazing. Mm. Um, here would be considered well done and um, tough, but they somehow do it well done. But tender, Greece. You go to, you know, you get like a souvlaki, beef one. You get these lamb chops. They would be considered well done and overcooked mm. here, but they are like so tender. I don't know, different cuts or different animals or diff- they, I don't know what they do. It just works. It's a mystery, guys. Yeah. <laughs> we haven't solved that one yet. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um. Yeah, I think um, I think that was a good chat uh, so far. Mm, thanks <laughs> for the first uh, for the first uh, episode. Good. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for being with us. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, man, thank you. Yeah. Great. Thank you for coming. Thank you. And um, that's all for today. Thank you. Bye. Have a good weekend. <laughs>